There's like five go live buttons I have to hit on this version, by the way. Okay, so a little bit more complicated, maybe. It is, but it, click it the link works. again. Oh, here we are. Yay. What's up? Oh, waka, waka waka. And it already has all the stuff. There it is. Here to And with that, I say hello and welcome to issue 608 of Geek in the City Radio. I am your moderately confused host, Aaron Duran. I am your patiently waiting, B. Narita. Hey, fantastic. How's it going? Oh, and I am your absent co-host, Cable Hashitani. Uh, uh, yeah, Cable, Cable has other things today. Well, I think we mentioned it last week. His family's in town and he would like to see them. Because yes. some yes. Okay. Oh, oh, almost, well, if we oh. didn't if we didn't say it before, it's out there now. So I think he mentioned that his mom the was in secret town. is out. Cable has family. <laughs> he was not merely birthed from a pod. <laughs> Damn it. Or so uh, he would have us believe. We haven't seen these quote unquote parents of his. That's true. I have met his I have I have met his sister of which he has told this story many, many times, and he loves to rub it in. Um, like 16 years ago, I started chatting and hitting it off with this quite beautiful uh, uh, woman at a pair at a comics event hosted by Pair for Homeless Youth. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was doing very well. Uh, I don't know if this lovely lady felt the same way. And I went over to Cable and I said, He's like, you having a good time? I'm like, yeah, I'm having a good time. And also, like, look at that, look at that woman over there. Like, she's really cute and she's fun. And I think we kind of were hitting it off really well. And he said, yeah, no, I can see how you guys have hit it off. I'm like, how would you know? He said, because she's my sister. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was like, yeah. And not that he cared about that, but I'm trying to remember. It's just if funny. She was, if she was with somebody, I think he was like, also, she's already married. She's just being nice to you. And I'm like, oh, God. Oh, Aaron, so thirsty. Well, no, and then I was like, Cable, is this just something your family does? And he was like, yes, it is what we do. Because- Plus like 10 six, charisma to all Hashitani. I know, well, because, and they also love this horrible, mean, and hilarious game. Because six months before, I had spent like an hour talking to this middle-aged dude about comics. And then we started talking about fucking Sandman comics and about how amazing they were. And I was like philosophizing on Sandman. I go to cable. I'm like, I'm hanging out with this dude. And he's really cool. Like we're talking about Sandman and he knows his shit and I'm giving my information about it and we're having a good time. And he's like, well, he should. He's the colorist on Sandman. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? He's like, because you wouldn't have been relaxed around him then. He's like, like you won't be now. I was like, that was a very, it was a very genuine conversation you were having. We were. Yeah, no, but that's a, that's a, that's a cable thing. So let that be a warning to you, Denise. If you ever end up hitting it off with someone, you go to hit cable and be like, we're hitting off really well. He'd be like, yeah, I know. Cause that's the person who created Sailor Moon. I just didn't want to tell you, you know, shit like that. I don't know if that- I was going to be like, well, that could never happen because X, Y, and Z, but uh, that's just going to ruin the joke. Uh, but yes, I will, I will prepare myself for that eventuality. It, it could never, it could happen. Never discredit cable's power to know someone in this world or the next, <laughs> you know, so. For sure, for sure. Don't discredit him. So. Here we go, share. It's so hard Cable, to uh, share Brad, these Facebook videos. I know, I'm sorry. Cable does know everyone. Uh, there used to be a not, well, it wasn't like a joke joke, but there used to be, um, it used to be kind of a quasi joke in Portland that cable was the pop culture fulcrum of this city. Like nothing in this, nothing pop culture happened in this city without cables tacit approval or knowledge of said thing happening. And even though he says he's been out of the game for a while, that he, he's still like the godfather of Portland's pop culture scene. Like yeah, still, you, don't, you don't stop knowing those people just because you're not as active as you used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, yeah, no. He's like the Don Corleone of of nerds. You have to go to him 
<laughs> ask permission. He's like, you come to me on this day of my daughter's marriage. I don't, that's not how it works, but you get the point. Well, on this, the day of my Manju's birthday. <laughs> that's right. There it is. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Uh, man, I have good news, but I can't share it. Aw, well, way to, way to bait everyone. You're welcome. Uh, more things were sold. Let's just say that. Fantastic. Yay. Uh, I look forward to hearing about it later. <laughs> when we turn off the live stream? Yes. Or, you know, whenever it is, you know, permissible for you to share it mm -hmm. in whatever capacity. That's fair. So we've got a. This might be the first show in a while that we don't review a show or a movie. Oh. Uh, well, that depends. Are we going to talk about Masters in the Universe at all? We're going to wait for Cable. I, I think we'll wait for Cable. Okay. I'd rather then, wait for Cable for his input on that one. Then you are correct. Uh, we will not be reviewing any shows or movies today. I'd like to say we won't be referencing Disney Plus, but that's not true. We will be referencing it. They sure uh, get a lot out of us for six ninety nine a month. <laughs> yeah, they do. Six ninety nine a month. Is that what it is? I think it's nine ninety nine a month. I don't know. Oh, I pay I, for the annual, so I I pay thirteen, but I also get ESPN and Hulu with it. And I only get ESPN so I can get women's soccer. I didn't end up doing that because you can only have basic Hulu, and Hulu's commercials are infuriating. Oh, I don't have that. So I pay for Hulu separately to have a higher tier plan that doesn't have commercials. Mm -hmm. <laughs> probably not as justifiable now i don't use hulu as much as i used to i don't either weirdly enough that's true um there is one bit of nerd news i want to drop that was announced like two hours ago so like a year ago it was announced that taiki watiti was going to be doing an animated flash gordon that has changed it oh. is now going to be a live action film of flash gordon and my brain is losing its mind at Taika Watiti doing fucking Flash Gordon. I don't know who you cast. I don't know what he does. But like, think of what he does with vampires and superheroes. Like he already takes things that are considered super serious and puts his spin on it. And now he's doing a live action Flash Gordon. Like my brain, my brain can't take it. Like it, it breaks. That's pretty exciting. It's super exciting. Now I want just this weird, awkward, like everyone's awkwardly by and fighting Ming and the world of Mongo. And I kind of hope that he finds a way to bring Brian Blessed back in. Like he's super <laughs> old now, but like, he wouldn't mind Taiki as Ming. That would be kind of cool. <laughs> He'd make a kind of great Ming the Merciless. I could see that. I could definitely see that. Or a Clytus. <laughs> Super snarky. I think I'd rather see him as Ming. I could see that. Not that like, and, I'm by any stretch of the imagination a like a pro, you know, like a, an expert on Flash Gordon anything. So I I feel like this conversation, if he was available, you should just rope Christian in so we can nerd out for like 20 minutes. Oh, sadly, he's, he's not here. He's he's my he's, he's my he's my Flash Gordon buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but he's he's with his other wife right now, so that's fair. Don't well, tell I'm, him I said that he doesn't like that joke. What? <laughs> what? That that could backfire. So we're gonna talk about stuff. Yes, first. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't say first, but we have two topics on the table for today. Uh, the first one is. Um, let me, I should have had the title saved on hand. So, uh, an opinion, uh, interview, right. let me see if I can for, find no, it. For, no, it's, it's, it's the New York times opinion Yeah, is what it is. And it is an audio interview with Hannah, uh, Nicole, Hannah Jones and Tanahasi Coates, um, both, um, uh, are going to be, or well, no, Tanahasi already is, and Nicole Hannah Smith is going to be. Uh, they're they're both um, going to be professors at Howard University. 
it's which is a daily. historically black I like the, I think it's like the biggest historically black college right them like the most it is famous prestigious you know college words yeah. yeah I also believe it's one of the historical black colleges that's forgiving all student loan debt Oh, that's right. Yeah, there was an article dropped yesterday, like 15 of the top historically black black colleges in America are forgiving student loan debt. If only there were historically Mexican or brown colleges in America. They don't. We just have strawberry fields. Um, Yeah. I I wanted to say something snarky about like, well, I guess the reparations are better when the crimes against your sect of humanity is worse but there's no there's no winning yeah. that argument so. no there's no winning the argument and i remember <laughs> actually a few years ago i was this super side topic i was chatting with keelan about this and keelan had like sent me messages he was like bro i had no idea that like for like 200 years like mexicans were being lynched in the southwest i was like oh yeah it just didn't get press i guess but yes <laughs> all the time that was a dark moment to take it. Uh, yeah, it's it's from the Daily, from Opinion, Nicole Hannah Jones and Tanahisi Coates on the story we tell about America. I think they re-aired it on the Daily, uh, oh. but that's great because I, that's I don't subscribe to the New York Times. I, I kind of wish I, I would like to, but uh, that's a that's a financial conversation I need to revisit. But the daily is free and it's a podcast, which means I can listen to it when I'm getting ready for work or whatever. And it's it's it has over the basically since the pandemic started has been a really, really great way to uh, have more deep dives into what's going on in current events, both on the national and international uh, fronts. Um, and every now and then you get more um, ad- you, you get additional content directly from other parts of the New York Times. But the reason we wanted to talk about this today is uh, because as most nerds, I'm sure are well aware, Ta-Nehisi Coates has, um, aside from journalism and opinion journalism, has also done a lot of writing. He's got a couple novels out, Mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, at least one nonfiction and or sorry, one fiction and at least one nonfiction, because I know he has at least three books, but I'm forgetting all of the titles and their details. Uh, and he's also known for having written a couple different comic books, including Black Panther. Black Panther and uh, Captain America. And he's going to be directing or writing, probably writing <laughs> the next Superman movie. Writing. I think it's going to be a, I don't, I know it's a J.J. Abrams joint i don't know if he's just producing it i hope he's just producing it um and also i don't know if it's the michael b jordan because there's another superman project in the works with michael b jordan as uh val zod the superman of earth 2 uh, i do believe co-created by nicholas scott yeah yeah uh yeah val zod showed up in earth 2 like 15 years ago the comic was just called Earth 2. First off, it was so good. It was a phenomenal comic. It had the Alan Scott Green Lantern, uh, who was in a relationship. He was married to another man. It, it was a good book. It was a really good book. Yeah. I haven't read it. Surprise. And the, and the Val Zod costume is like a color reverse. So it's all blue. And like his cape is like yellow. It's, it's a cool costume. It's a really mm. cool costume. Yeah. I should probably check it out. I, I have only read his books, not none of his comics. Uh, um, but I read Between the World and Me, and then also The Water Dancer, which is his fiction one. And he has the most beautiful voice. Like, he he is so articulate, and like he even well, even in the nonfiction side, he like he really just paints a really wonderful picture uh, yeah. about the content that he's discussing. And so it's it's. It's just wonderful. And, he, uh, and I he listen is someone to I could, He is someone I can listen to talk all day long. I can just listen to him speak. Yeah, and he does actually have, like, physically have a great voice too, which only adds to his eloquence. Um, I love, um, I love intelligent interviews. One of the things that kind of drives me nuts about the daily is, I mean, it's good and it's bad, but like, it's it's really hard to listen to interviews with a lay person 
versus, you know, a, a, an educated uh, person, an expert in the topic of conversation, because right. they, they just have a very different way of speaking and getting the point across because they, because they are experts in it versus when you're talking to a regular person, um, like for example, today's episode of the daily, I was just getting really, really mad because the first half of the installment was uh, interviews, like brief interviews and conversations with uh, owners and managers within the restaurant and hospitality industry. Who have bias, but maybe not informed takes. Who have some really shitty takes on stuff. Um, and it's it's frustrating because you can tell that they're only looking at this issue from their perspective and how it's affecting them. And, right. and because they're <laughs> angry and hurt, they just feel like they can have all these opinions. And between that and like being out in the real world today, again, in restaurants and bars and shit, mm. uh, right around lunchtime, I was like, if I have to hear the phrase, people just don't want to work anymore, I'm going to just start like, kicking and punching in, in the air. And if you're in the way, then that's just what's going to happen. Oh, are you starting to get that now? Um, well, what's funny With, is I had stopped Without getting somewhere. yourself in trouble with your job. No, no, no. What happened what actually was I was stopped for some lunch. I was starving. So I, I pulled over somewhere. It was a little sushi place with the little thing. That way I could just mm -hmm. get in and out. Um, yeah. And some guy walks in and he's sitting down and they're talking and... It's, for some reason, they got into the conversation of like hiring people. And the guy is saying, well, the guy behind the, the counter is saying like, yeah, I, we hired someone and they were supposed to start today and they never showed up. And the guy who is sitting down, the, the patron at the sushi place is like, yeah, man, people are just lazy. They don't want to work. I'm like, and again, that was the topic of, of, of today's episode of The Daily. And I'm just like, I, mm. it's just, it's infuriating. Um, luckily, if you get to the end of that episode of the daily, it's they turn it around and they start talking to people, the people who don't want to come back to those jobs and why. And it is really, really nice to uh, hear people like remind, remind the world, we weren't supposed to want to come back to work, because that's where everyone was dying, right? The whole reason the government is paying out this much money for unemployment is because we didn't want them to go to work. And now there's just all this outrage about how everyone just wants to be on the dole and be a slacker and have handouts. And that's that's not what it is. That's not what it is. So I can't. It, it's just it's frustrating. Huh. Uh, at any rate, the reason we wanted to talk about that interview is because that uh, naturally, like with anything featuring Ta-Nehisi Coates, it, it does tie back into comments, comics, and and the interviewer asks a couple questions about their uh, both Ta-Nehisi and Nicole uh, Hannah Jones, what um, what books they recommend and how being writers and consumers of comics, like why it matters, why it's, what influences it brings to the world and current events. Right. So do we start with that or do we start with the Scarlett Johansson and Disney thing? Uh, I feel like one adds more positive than the other. Yeah, so let's talk about Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> yeah, so. I'll give the backstory on this. Uh, Black Widow got, first off, Black Widow got delayed for almost a year. Although one could argue that Black Widow got delayed by about five years because she probably should have had her own solo movie right around Civil War. Right, it was, it was long overdue. <laughs> Way overdue. Uh, and I think personally, that's one of the reasons why it got hindered. But um, anyway, they film it. And then a pandemic hits and it fucks everything up, uh, especially theaters and, and whatever. And you can't get mad about that. That is what it is. Um, <clears throat> it's finally announced that Blackwood is going to get a bumped theatrical date. But by then, Disney has started doing the day and date releases. They do the premiere access. Mm -hmm. They started with Mulan. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so basically you pay, if you have a Disney plus account, you pay 30 bucks and you get the movie the day it comes out theatrically. It doesn't hit traditional Disney plus for like 60 days. Right. And I know a lot of folks were like, that's such a ripoff, blah, 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 blah. And I Not already for have families. Disney plus. Yeah. It's for families. Like if you have, if you're whatever, two parents, two kids, and they want to see Mulan, First off, it's actually cheaper. Way to buy more than 30 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if you have kids, how many times are they going to want to watch Mulan? Or I forgot what the other premiere release was um, before Black Widow. But either was way. It, was it Cruella? It was Cruella. <clears throat> it was Cruella. Um, if you have, I mean, hell, if it's, your, if it's two parents and even if it's one parent and one kid in the long run, that's a steal for how many times your kid's going to want to see it. So whatever. I don't really have a big beef with Disney charging extra for these releases, even though you're already a subscriber. I get it. If you don't want to watch it, wait. <laughs> like wait the two months and watch it when it becomes regular Disney Plus, whatever. I don't give a shit about that. I think it's a pedantic argument. I think it's people that just want to be mad at Disney having another reason to be mad at Disney, but. Sure. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, you know what? You Capital got capitalism is going to do what capitalism is going to do. Yeah, but in a weird way, that's actually a good deal. Again, if Mulan comes out and your kids are losing their mind, they want to see Mulan, you got two kids. You know what? It's fucking cheaper than going to the theater. It's also a lot less effort. You can imagine like loading up your whole fucking family into the minivan yeah, you know and what? taking them down to the nearest Cinemark to, and then getting them yeah. out. And, getting them through the fucking concession stand without spending another million dollars and they're screaming and you know crying. And, and then you, you gotta get them to sit down and shut up and watch the damn movie. Yeah, you how know much, what? You how much is like, how much is that emotional labor worth to you? It's like when you're like, I could make that and someone says like, yeah, but how much is your time worth? You know what? What's cheaper <laughs> is buying Premiere Access. And now we're doing a fucking ad for Disney Plus. You buy <laughs> Premiere Access, you buy your two liter bottle of Coke from your local grocery store, you put in some microwave popcorn, you throw some candy at them. <laughs> and then you, and then you know what? You order Pizza Hut. You oh, order God. pizza and you know what? You go do something else. Well, gr uh, granted, like, I think I mean, you may want Black Widow is probably Whatever. a little bit older demographic, but. Yeah, but if I had a bunch of friends that were like dying to see Black Widow and none of us felt safe to go to a theater and I said, hey, look, all of you check in five bucks and I'll buy it. We all hang out. We order a six pack. We order pizza, and we all watch. You know, we all watch David Harbor with a Russian accent. Awesome. <laughs> so that's what happened. <clears throat> and what's interesting is that it had it had pretty huge opening numbers. It broke pandemic box office records. Yeah, and its premiere access numbers were good. It made like sixty million dollars on premiere access numbers. Uh, but the problem is that, um, and I, I learned that this is something that has gotten pretty common is actors, uh, and they used uh, Robert Downey Jr. as an example, actors will agree to a smaller paycheck to make them make and be in the movie. But as part of the contract, they are getting back end money through box office. So they're going to take home a percentage of box office. Yeah. Um, and so when you, <laughs> you have one product and you are splitting it into two different delivery methods, but the I'm only, only getting paid office. for this one. And, and it's already an environment where the market is, um, what's the word? Um, pushed it's not down. saturated. It's no, it pushed down. It's, it's uh, suppressed. The market is already suppressed. suppressed. Yeah. Um, that's that is money that you are losing sure because you 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 agree to less now more later right and it's um and by less now we mean she agreed to 20 million up front uh, right all things being <clears throat> relative um and by the way everyone takes that deal now because of jack nicholson and uh the 89 batman movie because he only took like five million for that but part of his contract is he got 5% of the movie. Damn, that's a oh, lot. Jack, Jack Nicholson made, because no one had ever done that before. They were like, why would he do that? Because he knew. He actually considers that his greatest role ever as the Joker. He's gone on to say that is my greatest role ever. Something about that script, he knew this is going to blow up. 
So he took 5 million and 5%. Like he made stupid money. He still makes it. He still makes money off Burton's Batman 89. Good for um, him. Yeah. So there's a few things to address, I feel like. First, like, I think its opening weekend was strong. It did what? 70, it did 80 million domestic. I don't have it, those numbers. But. So I think, let, I, let me remember. I think it did. I think it did 80 million domestic. It did 60 million premiere on Disney Plus, And it did another like 70 million international. That's a decent opening. Perfect. That sounds about right. I know I saw the numbers. It's um, a decent opening. Yeah, it's, it's not bad, but by the letter of the contract. Right. We'll get to that. It's it's not what was agreed to, and and there there is some sort of verbiage in the contract that says like if you know the movie can't release or like I think maybe this was like addendum paperwork after you know it could not be released in the initial at the, at the um, originally intended release date because of COVID. Um, they they you know they were supposed to come together and in any any changes to the release of the film were supposed to be mutually agreed upon yeah and and uh scarlett johansson's lawyers are saying that they they did in fact try to communicate and coordinate with disney on this change of release format and that they were not responded to right i mean the big issue is that during pretty much all of 2020 the only thing disney made money off of was disney plus mm -hmm. uh, and they did crazy numbers like they're they're they projected something like they projected something like they were hoping for something like 20 million subscribers by 2025 like they hit that in 2020 right the, the disney plus is probably the only thing that was really helped by the pandemic well, I, I think any streaming, HBO Max, Disney Plus, Paramount Plus, they all got kind of in a weird way helped by the pandemic. Here's mm -hmm. the problem is that all of the money that board members, stockholders, and CEOs receive is 100% based on stocks and shareholder dividends. And that's only paid when your stock goes up. And Disney stock took a tank when the parks closed because... I know a lot of people see that like, you know, the Avengers makes a billion dollars. They have all these things. The fact is Disney's profit comes from the parks straight up. Like everything else makes money, but it's profit comes from the parks. It really, really does. And when that was gone, Disney's profit was fucking gone. Um, there was a time during the pandemic where Disney was losing $13 million a day. And that's, you think, oh, it's a multi-billion dollar company, but that's a, still a stupid amount of money, even if you are Disney. And when Disney Plus starts to stretch its legs, that improve the stock numbers, which even though the stock market is complete bullshit, it's a fantasy in 100%. There's no basis in reality to the stock market. It's, it's um, monopoly with real world consequences. Yeah, totally. But the thing is when Disney Plus started cranking in numbers, the shareholders, the board members and the CEOs start getting paid and paid well. Mm -hmm. So then there's the argument of like, all right, were you more worried that Black Widow was going to tank theatrically? Or did you feel like this is the return of the MCU? How many people can we get onto Disney Plus with the return of the MCU? Yeah, we'll put it theatrical, but how many, how many pockets of our own can we fill by doing this right that's the shady shit and that's what that's what a lot of the speculation seems to be based around is like they thought that it was going to be a good way to continue to boost their subscriber numbers 100 percent um and i mean already for many many months now there's been a lot of like oh netflix is going down because you know xyz streaming cert platforms are Ooh. are taking away their their subscribership and then pulling it over to theirs, you know, which Disney isn't, which only isn't being true, one of them. But yeah, no, no, I don't know anyone who canceled Netflix to have Disney no. Plus ne or Netflix Paramount big, Plus or any of them really. Netflix's biggest problem right now is that it has no massive IP. That's why Netflix is putting out a movie every week. They're trying to get an IP. Whatever. Putting out some good stuff though. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, oh my god. Better than Amazon and the fucking Tomorrow War, which is just unwatchable. You're, um, unwatchable. Your Klingon poster behind you. <laughs> when you when you move at certain points, it um it activates the facial recognition right over your shoulder. So it like, yeah. like I'm like, oh my god, there's someone behind you. Um <clears throat> it's it's okay. It's it's uh it's it's core. It's fine. It's protective, protective. Um, yeah. Klingon ghost. Um, uh, now I've totally derailed nice. myself. Uh, 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 everyone's saying Netflix is dead because of other streamers. Right, right. And that's, I don't see that. I mean, I, I don't sit around like following the numbers that they make, their revenue or their subscribership or whatever. But I just like in real world context, I don't believe that for a minute. No, also Netflix's subscriber numbers are still like double everyone else. Like their numbers are stupid. Mm -hmm. They're high. They're uh, so to, high. To date, I believe everything is Netflix and. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? No one still says Disney Plus and chill or Hulu and chill. <laughs> it's still, right. like in a weird way, Netflix is becoming the Kleenex or Xerox or Jello of streaming. Like, what'd you want? Uh, 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 you know, Netflix. Was it really I mean, on Netflix? Actually, I don't know. Yeah. They were the first ones. Yeah. Well, maybe not um, the first ever in terms of streaming because they did start out with that whole disc exchange situation. They weren't, but they were the first one to make it work. Yeah, they were the first ones to go like mainstream with it and yeah. actually like have a presence in the market. 100%. So I don't know. In the end, here's, and we're going to, we'll dive more into it. And Bex brought something up, which is a whole other conversation. But in the end, my thoughts are this. A, like, I will admit I haven't seen Black Widow yet. I've been told it's one of the best Marvel movies ever, but every time I talk to an MCU fan, like, it's the best one ever. I'm like, is it really? Because you say that every time one comes out. Okay. Um, but I have talked to people that are actually very critical of MCU films that are like, it's a solid spy action thriller. Like it, it hits it? those targets and it happens to just be an MCU movie. But like, if it was that good, its domestic box office wouldn't have dropped so fast. And here's the problem I have. I feel bad that I'm now like ripping on the MCU's first like woman focused film because I want it to not well, no. park. No, there's already oh, Captain, Captain Marvel. Marvel. I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah. Oh, that did gangbusters then. Okay. Well, then whatever. <laughs> now I don't feel bad. And this one's I only the second. I, I think from a narrative stance, the thing that hurt Black Widow the most has nothing to do with the pandemic or Disney Plus. It's that it came out when we already fucking know what happens to her. There's no real emotional investment in her anymore. Right. And and also Scarlett Johansson has has made a lot of poor. She's not helping her brand. Career moves and statements, and and that does not make her the type of actor that I actively want to support. There's other actors where I'm like, I'll go see anything they're in. I'll, I will stream whatever. I don't even care if it's a sort of uh, license or product, like, you know, like, uh, what's the word? It could be like a genre, genre or platform. a style yeah. of film I don't even like, but I'm like, but they're in it, I'm in, whatever. Yeah, everyone has that performer. She right. ain't one of them. She is not. Um, I don't think she's ever has been. There was a time where incredibly gross and sexist dudes were like, I'm going to see her in anything because she's got huge cans. Because there was a time where everyone just wanted to see her naked. Like that was why people went, is she going to be naked in this one? Which is gross. But yes. at, I don't take this at, here's the thing. She actually is a good actor. I think she's got a lot of skill. I think she's very good. Um, but for me, the thing that really kind of turned me off to her as a performer and Ghost in the Shell? It's Ghost in the Shell. Like, and actually, and Cable has talked about this before, where like, you know what? Even if she had stuck with the casting, there is a story to be told where a white woman wakes up in the soul of a Japanese woman's body. He's like, there's a story there where you wake up and be like, what did you do to me? I'm not even... I don't look like my mom anymore. Like you took everything from me and you've made me this like blonde white woman. Right. I mean, well, you, I could, you could argue hair. that um, carbon, altered carbon is that. Sure. 
but they didn't do that. She's still the major, and the major is a Japanese woman. And not only and, that, but when people challenged her on it, she doubled down. She's like, well, I'm a woman, so I should be allowed to do exactly. whatever whatever I want. It's, it's still empowering. And I'm like, no, this is the type of feminism that makes- She pulled that white uh, feminism makes, shit. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Sack in the chat pointed out uh, that they reject the idea that stories lack weight once you know how the characters die. And I, I do want to address that because I know that I very early on was like, yeah, I'm not excited about Black Widow. <laughs> I already know what happens to her. But I think, I think again, that, that was that was a shorthand for me not being prepared to or aware enough to articulate that I just am not invested in Scarlett Johansson. Yeah. And and to a to a to a secondary but not necessarily lesser degree, I'm also not that invested in Black Widow because she's <clears throat> the character has not really. They didn't give her enough development over the course of the ten years that she was in the MCU, and and now and now, way way later, you want to give me a movie to tell me more about her her life? I'm like, yeah, but that, all of this is over now. That's funny because. Um... And years before you joined the show, way back in the day, it was Scott and myself and Keelan. We reviewed the first Avengers movie mm -hmm. and we actually got like a lot of pushback from people who are now very loyal listeners of being like, oh my God, there's finally a woman in a superhero movie and you just discredit her. You talk about how she doesn't matter. And like we had to respond to it. We're like, you guys don't understand. We all actually know Black Widow from the comics. We're annoyed that they didn't fucking do enough with her. Yeah, she'd always been sort of in the background, even when she she's- got, She got Whedon. That was the thing about when you give Whedon the Avengers, they have, he has so, oh, Whedon can do women characters. Well, no, but he even, can't. Even until the very end, once it once we get to Civil War and Endgame, even as like the, the de facto leader of the remaining Avengers, it's just, it's just flat. She, mm -hmm. they, they never wrote for her, wrote for her well. They never gave her as much screen time as she deserved. And she also never got a fucking origin story seven to 10 years ago when it would have actually been appropriate and made her matter to us more in the long run. Yeah, you could have, and now we're just rewriting the MCU. <laughs> I honestly feel like you could have placed the Black Widow movie after Avengers uh, Infinity War when she's the only one keeping the Avengers together. She, Natasha still believes in the dream of the Avengers. Half the world is gone, but she's like, we have to do better. That scene where she's basically running the war room and like she talks to, uh, what's her name in Wakanda? And there's like, do you need help? And she's like, no, we've got this. She's like, are you sure we've got this? Like, there's the movie, right? If you want to even throw her past, you want to have her go back to Russia, great. Right, but like, like how, how, how it ties the movie. in. Mm -hmm. She should have had just... a movie between Infinity War and Endgame. That's where I think it would have played the strongest. And again, I don't know that I'm necessarily like supporting what Sack said or uh, all this to say, like it's a myriad of things. The character was done a disservice from the beginning. They waited too long to put this movie out. And yeah. also Scarlett Johansson has lost a lot of her goodwill within the, the fan community. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and all that boils over to, you know what? I'm, I'm not gonna pay 30 bucks to see this on No, on Disney you Plus. know what? I'll, I'll watch it when it comes regular Disney Plus. That all being said, in terms of contracts and going forward, Disney done her wrong. Disney done Scarlett Johansson yes, dirty. They, they, That's the thing. they tried this to is, loophole her. Yeah, this is the aliens versus predator of the modern contract. No matter who wins, we lose. But as much as I don't personally like Scarlett Johansson because of choices she's made. And statements that she's put out. Uh, as she's right, Disney fucked them over. Disney is in breach of contract. Mm -hmm. Well, and I know that Emma Stone, uh, you know, who did Cruella and they did the same sort of situation, uh, they, she was asked if she was considering doing this as well. And she said that she was weighing her options. The difference being Scarlett Johansson is done with Disney. I guarantee you they, they have the contract oh, is over. Black, she Black has, Widow like, is, they Black don't Widow want her dead. anymore. Right. Scarlett um, Johansson as Black Widow is dead, dead, 
dead. But I just mean like even before the lawsuit, I'm sure that like on paper they had no more uh, plans for an ongoing relationship, Disney and uh, Scarlet. I don't know. Death means nothing in the MCU anymore because of Loki and Vision. But if she thought that she had an opportunity to continue to have that character and play it, play, portray that character, do you, don't you think she would have? Oh, back? I see. I see what you mean. She read and that's what I'm saying. It's like Emma that... Stone. Emma Stone is in a good place professionally. They've already greenlit Cruella too. I mean, yeah. So she's not going to harm that professional relationship. Uh, no, you're right. I'm sure Scarlett read without... the script and went like, Florence Pugh's a new Black Widow? Then fuck it. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know exactly what the, like, what the feelings behind that were. I just suspect that, like, their business relationship was coming to an end, and that's why she felt comfortable, you know, taking this action. Whereas other actors, you know, like, once... Once you try to sue Mickey Mouse, chances are good they're not going to want to work with you anymore. And that's a huge, yeah. that's a that's there, a huge fish if you can get it. You don't want to fucking let go of that. There is there is one potential thing on the horizon, and it's been into that, but who knows what will happen. And unfortunately, this is the one that could create the change within Disney honoring contracts, is that now it could potentially be a man going after them. But there are rumblings that Dwayne Johnson is not happy about the dual release of Jungle Book. Mm. And Disney is in the Dwayne Johnson market. His ex-wife, Danny Garcia, who produces all his shit. It's actually kind of amazing. Like he and Danny, his wife, got a divorce like 15 years ago. Then they formed a production company. Did not know that. Oh, yeah. So whenever you see anything that he does that says produced by Danny Garcia, that's his ex-wife. Like, they do everything together except Aww. except sleep together. Like, he's shown pictures of their mixed family. He's like, here's my ex and her husband and their kids and our kids and my wife and our kids. Yeah, they do everything together. Um, there are rumors that he is not happy with the dual release. And my own fandom aside you don't piss off the rock. There we go. See, that, I, yeah, I don't want it to, to turn into this conversation about like, well, these are women and he's a man. But what I, what I do see here is that, yeah, the rock, he has leverage. And if, if he is, he is displeased with something that magnet. Disney has done, he yeah. can throw some weight around. Yeah, Emma Stone, last... hmm, I don't know. I don't not know. Bad, but, not bad, but... No, like she's, no she's, like, she's young, beautiful, and a good actress, but those are not rare. No. They, they, you could easily replace Emma Stone with another and, woman. And, 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 or, uh, I, that sounds so shitty to say, but... No, uh, it's... Mm, filmmakers will just find a different, beautiful, young woman. There's yeah, only this, one The Rock Johnson. Yeah, and here's the thing. This is actually not... I'm going to go back on the movie thing here for a little bit. Movie history... This is not always a men always have more power in Hollywood in terms of stardom. That's for the most part, that is true. But there was a time in the 90s, you didn't dare piss off Julia Roberts or you were fucking done. Right. She's America's so, fucking sweetheart. Yeah, no, it's all about star power. And regardless of how you feel about Dwayne Johnson, for the past few years, he is the number one earning man globally. He just is like he makes money. There was a time that it was Tom Cruise. There was a time that it was Jim Carrey. There was a time that it was Julia Roberts. Like that's how this shit goes. Actors who so are if, a brand unto themselves. Yeah. You say that you've got, yeah, there, it happens. You say that you've got, you know, 20 years ago, if you, 15 years ago, you said that Tom Cruise in your movie, you could just add 40 million to your box office like that, like straight up global box office. We're attaching 40 million to it. Julia Roberts was the same way back in the day. It was like Jim Carrey. Right now, it's Dwayne Johnson. Like you mm -hmm. just, he just means money. Um, but going back to it, like Disney's in the wrong here. And everyone who listens to the show knows that I'm a big Disney nerd, but I can still call it as what it is. And as much as I don't like Scarlett Johansson, I hope she wins because contracts need to be honored. Well, and 
this is so weird to to look at it this way, but <clears throat> Disney is still a corporation and actors are still individuals. And something that was brought up in the chat earlier that I, I'm glad I didn't like lose track of. Um, once you start establishing, like once you lay down the precedent for like what, you know, like defending the rights of actors, hopefully that can open the door and pave the road for, you know, defending the financial rights of other people who help create a film when, or, or any licensed product, when, when that product continues to make profit in multiple different arenas. Yeah. So we're talking writers and artists and creators. Yeah, all all of the different creators. There's so many hundreds of people that are involved in the making of a movie, but really a lot of the time we're only ever talking about like the directors and producers and the actors. Yeah. And, and, I and like sometimes the writers, if they're like a big deal writer. Right. But I, I get what I think what she's saying is that like all of these billion dollar franchises, especially within superhero stuff, they all came from folks that put in time in the trenches and work for hire. And I know there's the argument of like, we did work for hire. It's not your thing. Okay, maybe not from a legal stance, it's not. But morally, like there are people who have created characters that now Disney or Paramount or Sony are making billions of dollars on and they're running GoFundMes to cover their medical bills mm -hmm. like the guy who created rocket raccoon thankfully like james gunn other fans stepped in but like it's just bullshit it's just yeah you if it, it, how can you create something that is making other people millions and, millions. and you are scraping to to just be alive yeah and i know it's all like we'll have a better contract or whatever but that's that's a that's a callous way to look back at it now there is a moral responsibility that I feel like these major film studios have to do more than give them special thanks right before the Teamsters credit <laughs> in the ending credits of any superhero film right now. Like, none of these things happen without these creators. They just don't. I'm reminded of a picture that a uh, friend of the show, uh, uh, Ben Dewey, drew like five years ago. He drew this picture of this one writer and artist like pulling like like on yokes like mules pulling a wagon and then the wagon had every corporation every merchandising every cosplayer everything on this one wagon as they're pulling it forward i'm like here comes your entertainment uh, you know and like that piece of art that he did at first beautiful because ben dewey um mm -hmm. but also like 100 percent true and these studios keep coming back to that well, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, uh, Sack is also giving another example. Uh, Ed Brubaker has stated that he earns more from the residuals from appearing on screen in Captain America Two than he than he made for writing the story that the movie is based on in the first place. Yeah, no, he's one hundred percent right. I, uh, actually, if you guys can find Ed Brubaker's, uh, well, he was on Fat Man on Batman about two months ago. So find the episode with Ed Brubaker. It's it's wonderful. Um, um, and then uh, our friend Greg Rucka, uh, whose version of Wonder Woman inspired the film, but I think the only thing he got for that was a thank you in the credits. Yep. Yeah. Um, the the creator uh, Len Wynn. <laughs> He created, uh, he's created many combo characters. He's still with us. Um, he created for DC many characters, but his most, po his most quote, famous character he made for DC is uh, Lucius Fox, played by Morgan Freeman in the Nolan films. The guy who basically runs and Wayne Enterprises. Yeah. Uh, he's also created a little known character you might've heard of in Marvel called Wolverine. Oh shit. He makes more money on residuals for Lucius Fox than he does Wolverine. Which is weird because Wolverine has had a lot more film like on screen and, time. And granted, it has to do with the it has to do with his contracts and whatnot, right. but that is Wolverine has carried the Fox Mutant franchise for almost 20 years. Uh, but Len Wen makes more money when Morgan Freeman says, Don't tell me, Mr. Wayne. Like <laughs> you know so 
Mm. Sorry, I, I was hope, just catching up with comments. I hope chat. Scarlett Johansson wins, if only because I personally feel that Disney is doing wrong by her contract and her winning will have repercussions in the future for people who don't make $25 million a movie. And, uh, you know, if, if people don't like that, then make investors star in the movies and see how much you like that. Yeah. All right. I'll be right back again. Just uh, why don't we just, why don't we just take a pause? Let's take a pause. We'll be right back. Sorry, everyone. What happens when there's only two hosts um, and someone needs to take a break? You don't have extra people to uh, fill, fill the airtime. Well, this is awkward. I'm going to turn off my screen.
Mm-mm-mm-mm. This is the part where I'm on my own on the show and you all can watch with me. Wrong. I'm here too. Ah! <laughs> and welcome back to issue 608 of Geek in the City Radio. Well, I can't remember the last time we had a break. This actually will make the commercials much more easier to find. Yay! Which, by the way, I hope you all enjoyed the opening where I talked about Wandering Monster, our newest sponsor. Right, Denise? Our newest sponsor? Be like, yeah, that was cool. Yeah! It's a great new spot for a great new sponsor. Way to sell it. Sorry, I, uh, I, it's like sad to admit, but I, I don't really listen to the show anymore. Well, you should at least listen just, to the opening. I should, I should. I, I used to religiously play back every, every issue, even if I wasn't in it, just to, if I was in it, just to, you know, pick up on things I missed. Uh, mm, no, because you sh- well, because po- doing a podcast is, involves a bit of multitasking. And then, of oh, course, for episodes that I wasn't around for, that I could see what I missed out on, which is always like, oh, man, what a good time that was. You're like, oh, it um, doesn't involve me. Who cares? No, I'm saying the opposite. Um, Are you? But that it, it's, it's a lot of time. Every it's a lot week. of time. I know. It, that's fine. Even you don't listen back to them, so I don't want to hear it. Well, that's not true, but okay. I thought you didn't. I thought you knew how to edit without playing the whole thing back. I still listen back after I edit it to make sure I didn't screw anything up. Very well. Because I have accidentally muted the entire show once. And when you render it, when it's muted, it, I, there was an episode once where it was the opening and then 40 minutes and then the commercials and then 40 minutes. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. Was that before my time? No, no. I caught it and edited it and changed it. It was not. It was during your time. Oh, it wasn't recorded on mute. Oh, no, I had to re-upload. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So should we jump into our next topic? I think I think we've we've uh, we've said anything that could be said about the Disney Star Joe situation. Uh, Scarlett Johansson is not a good person, but she's also right. Which is actually a really good segue into some of the things that were discussed in our next uh, in our next topic. Take it away. Uh, so again, as we discussed uh, at the top of the show, um, we uh, we mo- many of us have now have since listened to this episode that aired on uh, the New York Times The Daily podcast uh, opinion piece between Stead Hearns. Uh, Tana Hussey Coates and uh, <clears throat> Nicole Hannah Jones. Oh my God, I can't believe I already forgot it. Um, uh, yes, Nicole Hannah Jones. Um, yeah. uh, Estead interviewed them because they are both about to be or are currently uh, professors at Howard University. Um, and amongst some, one of the many things that they discussed was the the role that comics plays in um, in journalism, so to speak. Right. Um, which, you know, without like trying to like inflate us too much, it's just kind of what we do here. We, we, we yep. take in as much pop culture as we can and dissect how it is affecting or how it reflects upon the real world that we're living in right now. Right. And, um, and if there's anyone who is a master of that art, it would be ta Coates. For sure. Yes. And yeah. I, I, don't want to take away anything from, or I don't want to like diminish the value that having uh, Nicole Hannah Jones in this interview had. It was she had she had very valid and interesting things to say. But I am I'm such a fan and familiar with Tanahasi that I definitely like hone in a lot more on the things that he has to say. Yeah, I think that you and I both know Tanahasi Coates more than than her. Mm-hmm. We're just more familiar with his work. So. Yes, this is the first time that I've actually heard of her work or the sixteen nineteen mm-hmm. project, at least directly. Oh, I really? know that. Yes, yes. I, I mean, mm. I, I, I gleaned that um, it ties into a lot of like what people are referring to as critical race theory right now, which is something I'm not well versed in to begin a- with. But AKA teaching America's real history, you right. just don't like it. Yeah. And that was a huge part of what this conversation was, is 
the the way in which people refuse to acknowledge or accept factual parts about American history, whereas all all that they want to do, Nicole and Tanahasi, is to to just like to just lay it out there that like without acknowledging black enslavement, you cannot have the story of, you know, like America's birth. Right. Uh, the really good example that uh, that one of them gave was, you know, in Germany, they were able to just shove all the Nazi shit in a box and then act like it didn't happen. Right. Like, just just make it go away um, because it was a period in their history. And they can they can try to move but, away from that. But they but, didn't make it go away. They like looked at bold in the face. Right. Right. I just I just mean, like, in terms of like the foundation of your country. Right. If you try to ignore or or erase uh, enslavement uh, and, and the foundations that it has in, in or the, the the impact that it has on the foundation of this country, you cannot tell the story of how this country was founded. But that's what people have been trying to do for the last 230 years is is build this narrative of how great America is, how how wonderful and magnificent the founding fathers were, um, but just kind of skirt around the fact that, you know what, they had the the means and resources to do a lot of what they did because they had free labor. Right. That helped them build their individual empires and fortunes that freed them up to be these political leaders, essentially. Right. But the, the thing that they also touched upon and that I think we'll do on this podcast, because we're, a, we're still like a nerd podcast, is that the, the podcast host like talked about, talk with Tana Easy Coates about how the impact of superheroes on the American psyche, the American mythology is very important. It is not just, oh, it's kids reading comics and men right. and women in tights punching each other. It's so much more than that. It, and so, go ahead. I yeah. actually wrote it down and I can share that with everyone for, you know, for anyone who hasn't heard it or just to like get a baseline on what we're, the, the part that we're honing in on here. Yeah, read it. Yeah. And so Estad Hearns asks, what are you trying to make it possible for people to imagine? Um, and I'll, I'll sk skip over a chunk of this because it's not a direct answer. It's more like a, a prelude to the answer. Um, but the, the, the meat of, of what we're looking at here today is he says, okay, this is, this is rude to say, but I got to say it. There are people I realize that I can never get to because their imagination is already formed and no amount of facts can dislodge them. Their kids, however... Their kids are still deciding and still being influenced in and, and figuring out what are the boundaries of humanity in the world that they live in. That is an ongoing battle. And mm -hmm. this sounds small, but there's a reason in 1962, they raised the Confederate flag in North Carolina because the symbols actually matter because they communicate something about the imagination and in the imagination is where policy happens. And that is, again, like one of the most beautiful ways I've ever heard of saying like, children of the future. You, when you put these positive, equitable, realistic worldviews into young people's field of view, you know, early and often, it, it creates a different perspective of what the world is and, and what people deserve and, and, going back to what Tanahasi said like it our, our our nation's history is built on the idea that this number of people were the ones who decided who is a human and who is not right and 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 if you're going to fix that it to, you know and whatever whatever iteration it exists in today you have to do it from an early point and and that's why he got into comics is because he recognizes that that's that's where you influence change. 
Yeah. And <laughs> the thing he talked about when he was a child growing up, and I can I kind of relate to this. <laughs> I don't know, like Denise, you didn't read up, you didn't grow up reading superhero comics. So your your mileage varies, but like all the superheroes that myself and like Tana Hesey Coates grew up with <laughs> were were white. Um, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Spider-Man, like all of them. They're 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 white people. And yet we still found the inspiration in them. We had to we had to see ourselves within them beyond their skin color. And you know, the, I've said this many times, like the bulk of my moral compass, it didn't it didn't come from church, it didn't come from the Bible. It came from superheroes. Like it really did. DC and Marvel were my moral compass, not not the Bible. And that might offend family members who still, for some reason, listen to the show with me. Not that I'm discrediting the religious teachings, but my moral compass came from superheroes. So imagine if you could keep telling those stories now, but put them in people who look like the readers. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's great that I don't think it's Tana Hesey Coates, but I think it's great that like Michael B. Jordan is doing Val Zod. That we're gonna get, I want Tana Hesey Coates to write his version of Superman. I'm glad that there's probably gonna be a black Superman. I love that DC now, and granted it's through future tense or whatever. Batman's always gonna be Bruce Wayne forever. That's not gonna go away. And I got no beef with that. But I like that DC is like, also, we're gonna have this black kid be Batman now. Mm-hmm. Um I like that in the DC future, Wonder Woman is a is a Mexican woman. It, it's Yolanda. Like I, it's a, like I'm 45 years old, and I saw the drawing that Joelle Jones did of the future state Wonder Woman with like brown skin and brown hair and brown eyes, and I like there was a part of me that was moved by that, and I should be well past that. Apparently, I'm not. Like, so I'm glad. I think the point that Tom AC Coates is trying to make, or at least how I read into it, is that these superheroes matter in terms of their morals and what they stand for and the inspiration they provide for the readers. And um, they don't have to be white dudes to do it. And the backlash we're getting, I think, is that for 80 years, they have always been white guys and that is what it is and now that they're slowly not becoming white guys the people who grew up with them the the, and i i'm trying not to bash on white people that's not what i'm doing here actually i'm actually trying to enforce their own anyway i'll get to it i think i I think i see what you're saying it's that it's like okay you spent 80 years having superman be like a white guy he has inspired you you looked at superman for 80 years or whatever your your father your grandfather your great grandfather whatever looked at the last son of krypton and in a way saw himself he had your skin color whatever um and maybe now he's not going to and you're mad about that why are you mad about that his his more his morality his ethics have not changed he just looks different now. And now he's going to get a background that maybe you're not familiar with. But try to imagine the last 80 years, if you didn't look the way you looked, if you were a black kid from Cleveland, you're a Mexican kid from LA, you're an indigenous kid in North Dakota, and you your all heroes bonded. never look like you. Your heroes never looked like you, but you know what? They were still your heroes. Mm-hmm. So why is it any different now that certain creators are now changing the ethnicity because the message is still there and if you embrace it it makes us all better it strengthens all of us so let that happen right um i mean i think part of the problem is that the people who are upset about these characters now looking like someone else like the, the the problem is they those individuals it was never about like the fact that the heroes look like them 
was never part of the thought process. It was just a given. This world was made for them. And I'm going to start sounding really radicalized right now, but everything about our culture and our society for, for 90% of the time that this country has been in existence was built for, by, and, you know, around whiteness. Yeah. And, and so you don't even have to think about it. It's, it's, it's already for you. And because there's no effort being made to appreciate the, the, the intended value of the, the product, mm -hmm. you're going to take away the wrong message. And you're not going to think about the fact that they look like you or not. It's just a given that they do. And now they're mad because when, because, because, because now that it's different, not only does it not look like them now that is, I think that that's making them more aware of the message that they they lost sight of ages ago if they ever had it to begin with. Yeah, these are, we, yeah. We talk it a was, lot about like the people who are mad because it seems like the only thing they really care about when they when they say that they're a Star Wars fan is, is the pew pew and the fighter jets. Even worse when it's Star Trek. Because there's not a lot of that. Yeah, they're, they, they are fans for the wrong reasons to begin with. And now yeah. that, <laughs> and it's, now that it's, it's being made to potentially appeal to or, or relate to anyone that is not them, now it's being taken away. Yeah, and it's not like, and I'll add that like, more work is being done now towards that. And that's a good thing. Uh, but, but spoilers to grumpy old comic fans, it's not new. I, I saw someone complain a few days ago about how they're done with Captain America. He's too woke. He's too doesn't all, he no longer believes in the American ideal. Blah 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 blah. And then someone like hold on, Bean, I'll get to it. Don't worry. <laughs> someone posted a picture from a Captain America comic from like the late '60s, early '70s, where. President Nixon, during the height of the Vietnam War, is acting is asking Steve Rogers, I, I need you to have our back, man. Like we're getting our ass kicked in Vietnam, and we've got these protesters basically, and I'm paraphrasing badly. And Steve Rogers tells him, No. And Nixon's like, We not, shouldn't be there in the first Do you place? not believe in the American ideal? And Steve Rogers, is like, 100 percent which is why I'm telling you no. Like you. This is wrong. I refuse to step in line. And, and that's why I, I love that quote that so far amazingly has not been attempted to be co-opted by the right wing. It's that scene where, and this was only a few years ago where Captain America gives a speech of like, it doesn't matter if you are facing hundreds of people who are telling you this is the way the world should be. Step in line, this is the will, this is it. He's like, if you know in your heart that it's wrong because it oppresses people, it makes the world a darker place. He's like, if you know that that's wrong, your responsibility is to look that mass in the eye and say, no, you move. That's Captain America. That's why I, I love Ta-Nehisi's run on Captain America. I actually think it's someone who has such a wonderful understanding of the of America's horrible past of enslavement. I mean, fuck, if I'm a Marvel editor, it's a no brainer to hire someone like that to write Captain America. There's right. no one better to write Captain America. There's no one better to write Superman than that. Superman, but, by the way, written, created by two Jewish immigrants who were escaping oppression in Europe, just, or their family were just. Spoilers, yeah. superheroes have always been Atifa. They have always been anti-oppression and fascism since day one. Always. Yeah. And I, I, that speaks a lot to, um, or it, 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 it kind of brings it back around to, again, like a lot of what Tana Hasi was talking about. By the way, it, it is Tana Hasi. We've been saying it wrong oh all this God, time. I'm sorry. Uh, no, I was too. I always thought it was Tanahisi, but I've never heard it out loud. Apparently, I've only read it. And uh, that's true. They, they have a whole yeah. like they have a whole commentary about it in this episode because Nicole yeah. didn't know what how it was either. It is Tanahisi. To uh, his credit, he's really cool about it. He's like, it's fine. It happens. Yeah, yeah, he totally is. Um, I mean, my last I'm name, like, 
my full name is technically supposed to be Aaron Durant. No one calls me that. Even I don't call you that. It's I know. Well, wouldn't it be weird at this point? Yes. If I was speaking to you in Spanish, I would. Yeah, that's true. But I, I have a hard time mixing the yeah, tongues. You're bad at, you're, yeah. Yeah, my Spanglish has no accent, even though I'm flipping back and forth. Not the point. I know. I've heard um, you talk to your mom. <laughs> um, comics has has always been about calling out the things that we're doing wrong. At least, you know, like a lot of the classic superheroes. That's well, not wrong. Comics has always presented a problem that has shown how is how we can be better. I mean, there's, I mean, isn't there like a bunch of stuff about like Superman used to like, you know, take down slumlords and. Yeah. Why is that him being wrong? That's him seeing slumlords and being like, you should lower the rent on these people. And the slumlords no. are like, no, he's like off the building you go. Right. No, no, no. I'm not saying the superheroes are wrong. I'm saying like a lot of the classic superhero stories were a way of talking about the way that American culture, like our, our, the, the way that we are do, like the way that we as a society are failing. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was a period during the 50s to about the mid 60s where it was all goofy shit. But that was the sure. comics code created by someone who was obsessed with young boys reading comics and making them all gay. Right, right. They they yeah. all uh, well, they were misconstruing the the message again, which is like a lot, but continues to be part of the problem, and that's why yeah, no, <clears throat> seduction of the innocent did more damage to the comics industry than anything than the direct oh, market God. could ever do. Well, what I'm getting at is that like so that was the purpose of comics in, in for, for a, a lot of comics. Their goal is to sure. highlight the way that we are doing things wrong as a society and how we can be better. And you were saying like, if I were someone hiring writers, I would absolutely hire someone like ta Coates because he straight out said in this interview, he's like, look, we're trying to be better. We, you know, we have words that we wrote on paper that like, you know, speaking about the declaration that like we're trying to live up to. And most of the time we don't. Very often we are failing to live up to the document that, that is the basis for who we are. Yeah. And, and comics is one of the ways that we are trying to point out to people, we're doing this shitty. We are shitty to each other. This is what we could be doing better is to embody the ideals of these characters. Right. I mean, yeah. America as a rule only has two art forms that they created. Jazz and comics. <laughs> like that's it. That's those are two original American art forms, jazz and comics. Um both in their own way came from people who were not white American mainstream. Jazz was born, uh, uh, my knowledge of jazz is very limited. Uh, jazz was born in, in Harlem. Jazz was born in, in places where- It comes where, from black culture. Yeah, and comics came from immigrants and people who grew up in slums and, and then of course like whatever. I, Hisham is saying the same thing in the chat. It's it's interesting when you look at the backgrounds of golden age comic creators. How many of them came from first or second generation immigrant families? Yeah, I, I, neither jazz or comics come from middle class white America. They just don't, and they are the two original American art forms. And I again, my knowledge of jazz is very limited, but one could argue right now that we are in a golden age of comics. Um, the, the superhero and the comic story is everywhere. And no matter what you might read about how comics are dying, A, that's not true, actually. In 2020, uh, Diamond showed a 20% increase in new, in new accounts. That means new comic book shops. Yes. Um, so ignore whenever you read a headline of like, is, this, is the comic dying? No, it, not at all. It's evolving as all art form does. Um, well, what I like, I'm, and I, I have not formulated this thought until just now, as we're kind of going over this, what it seems like to me is that we've, we've come full circle 
Definitely. Uh, you've talked about this a lot. I can't necessarily speak to it myself, but there was a, a, a great chunk of time where comics was having this like huge boom in terms of profitability, but not necessarily in terms of like the qualities of the quality of the stories being told, the the messages that were being sent. Sure. Uh, a I lot mean, of like like a lot of dark, gritty shit that didn't really have the same heart and soul as, yeah, that, as that, preceding stories of the same characters. Yeah, the early to mid 90s of comics, everyone was making stupid money. We, it was like Wolves of Wall Street. But back then it was nothing but like women that didn't have a spine so you could see their double D titties and their massive ass. Simultaneously. And then and then, and then dudes with lots of pockets. Like that was the 90s. <laughs> lots <Made> of money, pockets. <laughs> lots of pockets. Made money hand over fist. Stories weren't good. Right. Um, and, but I'm and, not. Go ahead. I was going to say, but I don't equate that. Right now in terms of art and writing and storytelling, this is the this is the best era of comics ever. Better than ever. The original times. One hundred percent. This is the golden age of comics from a creative stance. The only hindrance is there are so many amazing books out there is that it's hard to read them all. Yeah. Yeah. The stories being told now are beautiful, are wonderful, are inspiring, heartbreaking. It's the golden age. It really, really is. Um, and I think it's because of people like uh, Tanahasi Coates. Did I say it right, Tanahasi. Tanahasi. Tanahasi Coates. I mean, he's he spit one factor of it. Oh yeah, and variant covers. Don't forget about variant covers. Well, although we still have those, and I think they're wonderful. Usually. Variant covers make shops happy. I have bought the occasional variant cover when it's an <laughs> artist that I like. I am all over that. I am not above that. You know, when I see that like Joelle Jones or Becky Cluden or Jacques is doing a variant cover, I'm like, oh. Michael, Michael, I want that variant cover. Mm -hmm. You know, which by the way, I'm going on almost three months not clearing out my box. I got to fix that because I'm a pop. I've only what? got like four titles, so it's not like it's a big. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know where else we can go with this tonight. Plus, we're pushing eight o'clock here. Yeah, no, I yeah, I don't think that we had like an end goal in mind when we decided to talk about this. We just wanted to highlight the interview, and 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 because we, a because it's quality, but also because it um it crosses paths with a lot of what we do here on this show, probably to a much more eloquent degree. But yeah. you know, I think I'm not think a, I'm what, not a Howard University professor, so neither am I. I have a BA from Merrillhurst who went out of business four years ago. So yeah, I have an associates from the University of Phoenix. Uh, super. <laughs> I, think, I have like zero credibility <laughs> with anybody. I think what it comes down to is um, if the superhero, I feel like I'm hammering on this, but if you're, if you're a white dude and the superhero no longer looks like you still buy the comic, like the morals and ethics that you like, like it's still there, but maybe you're going to get something else out of it. And that can be applied to anything. Star Wars is more diverse than it's ever been. Star Trek is more diverse than it's ever been. It's still superhero comics. It's still a galaxy far, far away. It's still the human adventure on the final frontier, but now it's more. So embrace uh, the fact that it's more. You just reminded that, that's me. That's what I want to ask you. Embrace that it's more and take it in. And you will be better for it. That, yeah, yeah. As as a as a white person, it would if if you want to be a white ally, the the a recommend a recommendation like a really low low key ask is for you to ignore what what the characters look like and and think about what they're saying and what they're doing more than anything else yeah uh or like i guess like in a slightly different way of putting that is to like actually make an effort to support art that does not represent you specifically yeah it's just because you, i i was very guilty of this myself i was once in a book club and there was a you know like a couple different books being volleyed around as to what our next read should be and one of them was a black writer 
it's writing about you know like a black character's experiences in xyz probably like a like a black neighborhood or, or something and i was just like oh man i don't know i have a hard time relating to that and that was like absolutely the wrong attitude to have you're never going to yeah. relate to something if you don't take the time to to learn about it yeah i and, mean and now i'm like that's stupid that was so stupid of me to do and say like if i could go back in time and like undo things i don't have a lot of regret in life but i'm like man i wish i hadn't that's said one of that them. yeah it's it's just uh, it's a bad look I will recommend to you to go start reading N.K. Jemisin's works. Her work it's, is amazing. It's, I, ha I own some of them. I just haven't read them yet, but I absolutely but, intend to. And I've heard but, nothing but great things. But to do what you say, like you and I are both Latinx people. You're a woman. I'm a man, whatever. Um, but like we both read Mexican Gothic, um, although we may both be brown. We've got fuck all in common with that character, other than the fact that we're both brown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so even even if you can identify ethnically with a character it's still a fantasy or a horror book and you've got nothing to come with it other than how you look on your skin exactly exactly most of we're what not I made consume, of mushrooms <laughs> i'm also not like victorian or an elf or a dwarf or an in starfleet you know you know in the 1960s whatever like most of what I've had to consume and loved throughout the course of my, you know, not quite 40 years on this planet, I've enjoyed, even though most of the time, like 80, 80, 95% of the time, none yeah. of them looked like me. None of them had a background that I could relate to. It's maybe like, maybe on a, like, just like a general personality level, I could be like, I, I yeah, can, I feel that. I can, I can think of one fictional character in recent memory that I can 100% identify with in a weird way. And it's the food truck dude from the Stumptown TV series. <laughs> Just a squat, chunky, hairy, brown dude who likes to make tacos and experiment with Mexican food. And be like, do you like it? Yeah. Like, okay. There's one <laughs> character. One character. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, oh, yeah. I, 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 now I'm on the spot and I could not name you a single character that I super super identify with and if I if I could think of one I bet you they're white because that's what's uh, out there historically I can see you identifying with what's her name from the expanse uh the granted, Naomi? you're not you're no you're not an Asian woman the other one. Oh, drummer 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 you're kind of wired like drummer which is badass <laughs> I've softened up a bit over the years. I don't know that you that's have, true but anymore. if someone crossed, but I can but appreciate if, them as my if, past self. But if someone crossed you and threatened your friends or your tribe, you'd airlock the fuck out of them. Oh yeah, yeah, there you yeah, go. yeah. There, there's the, the only reason people I I'm I have only pushed away to still breathe oxygen is because I can't push them into space. Yeah, there you go. Sure. Let's wrap up the show. All right. Uh, next week, we're going to have on Steve Coker. That is correct. We are going to be talking about his game and that is yeah, so in development. And now I'm like, fuck, what is it? <laughs> uh, Dex Dixon. De yeah, thank you. Dex Dixon something something. It's So if you guys are familiar with the name Steve Coker, uh, he's the guy that put on Flash. Ah! Uh, but, his, but his first stage was an original character named Dex Dixon, paranormal detective. Right. And he is and now creating a board game around that character. I have the title. It yeah. is uh, It is called It is just called The Adventures of Dex Dixon, the board game. So very, very easy. I should have had that. But so, uh, yeah. we're going to test it out and talk about it. Well, we're going to pre-test it out and then we will yep. be able to talk about it deeply. We're going to... Next yeah, week. we're gonna we're gonna play test this week this week, and then we're gonna have cable will be back, and we're gonna have Steve on, and we're gonna talk about the board game. It's gonna be cool. So with that, I'm Aaron Duran. I'm Beanerita, and uh, we will talk to everybody next week. Watch out for snakes. I took it from you. And listen to the daily. Yeah, do that. That's yeah. good. It's good stuff.